in the rotunda of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum is a granite floor depicting a map of the earth. In it are 57 brass sheaves of wheat signifying countries saved from starvation by Herbert Hoover after this century's two world wars. At the base of this map are Mr. Hoover's own words. In two wars I served amidst famine and in the war-shattered aftermath, I directed reconstruction in many nations. Uppermost in the minds of plain people everywhere was that war should cease and that peace would come to the world. John Langenhan. Uh, we're volunteers uh, at the Hoover Presidential Library. So we'll begin with his birth right here in this little town of West Branch. And uh, if you know how small West Branch is, it was even smaller back in uh, 1874 when the young Bertie was born uh, to uh, Jesse and Hulda Hoover. This is a picture of Bertie when he was uh, about one year old, and next to it, a picture of Bertie at three, and then Bertie with his brother and sister, uh, Tad, Theodore that is, and uh, Mary. Now when these children were very young, their mother and father passed away. Uh, Bertie was only six years old when his father died, and he was only nine years old when his mother died. So at a very young age, these three children were left orphaned. And at that time, because they came from a rather humble, poor family, they were unable to stay together as brothers and sisters, and each child was sent to a different home. So about the age of nine, Bertie went to live with an uncle just outside of West Branch. And there he lived the life of a young farm boy and engaged in his favorite sport, which was fishing. Well, Bertie lived with his uncle outside of West Branch for one year about, and then his uncle John, uh, who lived in Oregon, asked him to come live with him. The house that you see in the picture over here is the home that he lived in, in Oregon. Well, by the time he was 16 years old, it was time for him to think of further education. He completed his time at the, what we would call, high school there, and he wanted to, more than anything else, become a mining engineer. He visited some mines and felt that this would be a good way for him to earn his living. So it was suggested that Herbert look into Stanford University. And uh, fortunately, he was accepted into the first class at Stanford University, and he began a more formal education. We have a chair here that he had in his dorm room. Uh, this particular chair has his uh, name carved in the seat of it. Uh, uh, so you see, Bertie wasn't too different from most of our boys and girls of today. He left his mark. Here is an interesting picture of Herbert Hoover. Uh, he had heard of uh, a job that was available for a London mining company and that they were looking for uh, an experienced uh, older gentleman, oh, probably in his 40s. And Bertie was very young looking. He had sort of a baby face. And uh, he felt he really needed to dress himself up uh, uh, to look a little bit older. So we see him in his top hat and mustache and very fancy clothes uh, ready for his interview. Incidentally, he must have had a very good interview because he did get the job. And uh, off he went to, of all places, Australia, leaving his beautiful young lady friend, the young woman that he was later to marry, Lou Henry. Lou Henry was also born in Iowa, Waterloo, the same year that Bertie was born. She left Iowa about the same age as Bertie did and moved out to California. 
So when Bertie was a senior and Lou was a freshman, they met one another, finding that they had uh, very similar backgrounds, both very interested in the outdoors and of course very interested in geology, engineering, and so forth. They enjoyed each other's company so much that they became fast friends and later on, of course, became married. When Herbert Hoover was a young man, 22 or 23, he took his first professional job in Australia. Now he was a mining engineer, and his job was to find minerals and stuff in the ground like gold and silver. And one day he located a rich vein of gold, and he went to his company and said, this thing is going to produce some money. Let us invest in it, and we'll see what comes out. They invested a million dollars in this gold mine, and by the time it got through producing, the company realized $65 million. So Herbert Hoover was well on his way to be a very successful mining engineer. He didn't like Australia. In his own words, it's a country of red dust, black flies, and white heat. The story is that he and his men took their baths in beer. And the story goes that he uh, raised two or three cabbages, but it cost about $200 worth of water. By the time Herbert Hoover left Australia, he was making $10,000 a year, which was a fabulous, fabulous salary for a young man or any person in those days. The company said, Mr. Hoover, we want you to go to China. But before he went to China, he sent a message to Lou Henry back in California. The message said, will you marry me? And Lou sent back, yes, come to California. Herbert left for California, married Lou Henry. The very next day, they went to San Francisco and boarded the ship for China. When Herbert and Lou Henry were sent to China. The Chinese government asked that Hoover develop the port facilities and then also that he locate uh, coal. But as soon as he got there, the government changed those instructions and said, find gold. So he went busy about his work as a mining engineer. While in China, he had thousands of people working for him and uh, he traveled quite extensively. Lou spent a lot of time alone in their home. One of the things she did when she was on these travels, she learned different languages. She was able to speak five different languages. When she was in China, she started to collect these blue and white porcelain vases. Some of these vases are 300 years old. Some of them are 500 years old. And if we knew the stories that they could tell, we would, uh, I think we would be enlightened. They're supposed to tell kind of happy stories. The blue and white signifies uh, the heavens and uh, things that are good. When the Hoovers were in China for a short time, the Boxer Rebellion occurred. Uh, that was an attempt by elements in China to get rid of all foreigners. And so the Hoovers were under siege for 10 weeks and it was a very dangerous time. Mrs. Hoover thought it was a delightful time. She didn't like war any more than Mr. Hoover, but she was kind of a, uh, an outdoors person, uh, a carefree person, and uh, she, she liked the challenge of different things. She did have a revolver like that around her waist. They're not sure that she ever used it. They do know that there was a, a, a cannon like this to uh, protect their compound. They do know that one day when she was playing solitaire, a bullet went past her head and stuck in the, uh, in the wall. Now, that, that bullet didn't make that big disaster. But uh, she, the uh, story goes, she said, well, let's pluck that bullet out of the plaster and uh, save it. And it was a souvenir that she kept for years. In 1900 or 1901, they left China, and Mr. Hoover went back or to uh, London, England, uh, to work for his company out of their London, England offices. They were living in London as a family. Uh, in spite of the fact that they traveled all over, they always 
uh, kept a home in California, and Lou always made a beautiful home for them wherever they might be, uh, a shack in the jungle or a lovely home in London. Well, as time went on, we find that uh, Mr. Hoover became, as it says here, a man of the world. And in fact, he took his family with him around the world. So the story goes that their oldest boy, by the time he was eight years old, had been around the world about five times. At the beginning of World War I, uh, Mr. Hoover was approached by a group of men and asked if he would help to organize a group of people to get uh, food materials to the Belgians who were starving. And he was willing to take on this uh, service to humanity, which he continued for the rest of his life. He began his life as a humanitarian and earned the title of the great humanitarian to which we re refer to him uh, to this day. He formed the Belgian Relief Commission, which uh, provided uh, food materials for those uh, people in Belgium. Uh, he crossed the English Channel, which was very, very dangerous at that time, to see that the food materials reached these people. But as the war progressed over there, he was helping France and more and more countries, and, and it seemed as if he was indeed beginning to feed the world. Well, here's Mr. Hoover checking in some of the flour uh, and wheat sacks with a young woman. Uh, in Belgium at the warehouse, and here are a stack of uh, sacks. I'd like you to, to notice particularly that these flour sacks are quite different from the ones that we have now. They aren't made of paper, they're made of cotton material. And uh, every one of those flour sacks, when it was emptied, had to be accounted for, because if they had fallen into the hands of the Germans, they could have been used for munitions. And soon those Belgian women and children began taking those flour sacks and embroidering them with messages and sending them back to Mr. Hoover and his family as a way of thanking them for helping them through this terrible crisis. So we have over uh, in the case here and uh, in some frames on the back wall, some of these flower sacks which are part of the very large collection of uh, thank yous that came to the Hoovers from the Belgian women. In the corner of this cabinet here, is a material which we refer to as famine bread, made of straw, water, and manure. But it is said that the people of Russia were using this as a way of, well, keeping the hunger pangs down. The Belgian women were famous for their beautiful lace making, their lovely uh, needlework of all kinds, sent many gifts to the uh, Hoovers of their lace, and also many uh, pieces of lace were smuggled to this country uh, to Mrs. Hoover where she sold them in order to uh, obtain money for the Belgium relief effort. The German government said that the lace industry could continue providing that there be no patriotic uh, messages or emblems uh, put into the uh, lace. And a lot of the lace that did leave Belgium smuggled around the waist of the men and women did have that stuff on them. In this gallery we have a television set on which there are several uh, elderly people who were young children during World War I and who actually were aware of the fine things that Mr. Hoover and his volunteers did in helping to feed the people of their country. It's very interesting to hear them tell of their own experiences. We did not know what Hoover rules were and she explained that there was a relief organization from Americans and uh, that was headed by uh, somebody called Herbert Hoover. And they are helping children uh, to get the first real meal. And uh, that role and that uh, hot chocolate, you, you don't forget that as long as you live. And on the other side of the gallery, there are uh, many different gifts uh, that were sent to Mr. Hoover and Mrs. Hoover, ranging from uh, pictures painted by young children, scrapbooks made by children, to very expensive and elaborate uh, gifts from heads of state. That box was presented to Mr. Hoover by Lennon. And uh, it's the only gift that we know of that has been asked to be returned by another head of state, Stalin, who wanted that box back. But as you can see, he didn't get it. 
here we are in 1917. Mr. Hoover and his family are back in Washington, and uh, Mr. Hoover has been asked to help with the war effort to help our country save food. So Mr. Hoover put in a lot of initiatives, such as he asked uh, school children to have a vegetable garden on their schoolyards. He, he asked families to dig up their, their backyards and, and plant things like uh, tomatoes and potatoes and beans. He asked all of the people in the United States to conserve by having what he called uh, meatless Mondays and wheatless uh, Wednesdays. And then he also asked people to eat smaller portions to save food. Did it work? It worked tremendously. And we were able to ship about twice as much tonnage of food over to Europe than we had before his efforts started. There is what is called a life mask of Mr. Hoover, so we know that he looked exactly like that. You notice in this mask the eyes are closed. Uh, of course, if somebody's going to put plaster all over your face, you're not going to want to get that stuff in your eyes. And so a life mask always has the eyes closed. Here's a nice little picture of uh, Mrs. Hoover laughing at her two boys. Uh, Mrs. Hoover always had time for her family. And I like this picture of what I would say is probably their dream home. Mrs. Hoover started planning this home towards the end of World War I. And in fact, she and the architect had many, many sessions together until it was uh, finally completed to her satisfaction. There's a diagram of the first floor here also. And uh, after Mrs. Hoover's death in 1944, uh, Herbert Hoover gave the building to the University of uh, Stanford. So now the president of Stanford lives in the Hoover home. Now, this is another one of the Hoover homes. This is in Washington, D.C in the early 1920s when Mr. Hoover was uh, Secretary of Commerce and so forth, they lived in this house. Down the street a ways, there was another house. And in that other house, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his family lived. They were neighbors, they were friends, but unfortunately, by the time Mr. Hoover started to run for president, and certainly by the time he was running for re-election, they were bitter enemies, and unfortunately, they never got over it. Nineteen twenties, a decade of change. World War One was over. The United States had become a modern industrial nation. New things were coming to the front all of the time. The development of radio and the news media, so that information was moving across the country and across the world so quickly. So that during that time, fads began to take hold. And we had women starting to come out of the home and sort of be liberated in a way. They cut their hair, which was a very unusual thing at that time. And we had people actually sitting on top of flagpoles for long periods of time and trying to get themselves, I suppose, into something like the Guinness Book of Records. Sports became very important, not just playing sports, but watching them. Bobby Jones in golf, and, you know, Babe Ruth and Herbert Hoover, uh, they were friends. In fact, he has an autographed baseball. baseball. Yeah. Somebody said to Babe Ruth, Babe, you know, you make more than the President of the United States. You know what Babe said? Of course you I know. can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, I'm having a better year. But a lot of famous writers came about at that time, and they were sort of social reformists in their way of writing, too, so we... Uh, started having a lot of new kinds of literature. And don't forget about probably the most important entertainment feature, our wonderful uh, movie heroes such as Rudolph Valentino, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> At the top there, of course, is Charlie Chaplin. Another very important uh, feature was the television set. And so we have a beautiful first television set and also a picture of Mr. Hoover, as uh, the first man who then became, later became president, to be televised. Uh, Mr. Hoover, when this was done in 1927, was in Washington, D.C., and the setting for this first uh, television uh, viewing from one city to another, the other one being New York City, Washington, D.C., to New York City, was in an undertaker shop. And I think the undertaker must have made the box that had this uh, equipment in. Herbert Hoover became the Secretary of Commerce in 1920 during the presidency of Warren Harding. And during that time, he made many changes in the 
the way our country had been doing things. Uh, since he was an orphan himself, he was very interested in children. And one of the most important things he did was to work with making children's lives easier for them and more comfortable for them. One of the things which boys and girls probably aren't too excited about that he began was the idea of having children vaccinated before they started the school so that they wouldn't be catching lots of diseases and passing them around one another. So this was a very important thing that he did. Another thing that he did was to standardize equipment. And that was important so that people could then repair their things rather than having to replace them all the time. So he would standardize automobile tires, nuts and bolts and screws, uh, measurements, so that uh, it would make it a lot easier to interchange parts. He also standardized road signs so that you knew that when you saw a triangular sign, it meant that you should yield to the other traffic. And he developed the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Commission. Radio was becoming very important at that time. Stations were beginning to broadcast, but many of them overlapped. And uh, it was very difficult to separate the stations. So he assigned wavelengths to each uh, radio station so that you could indeed listen to your station and another station wouldn't interfere with that. Uh, he was criticized by some uh, that he was trying to make things too much the same. Hooper said that's nonsense. He said if things are easier to make, cheaper to buy, easier to fix, that gives the American people uh, more time to enjoy life, more leisure. He said life has to be a combination of work and leisure. He was involved in the Better Homes of America, and the purpose of the Better Homes of America was to encourage people to uh, have their own homes, and home ownership did go up dramatically, and he lent his support to that. It's kind of interesting here, he cut away the kitchen, and you see a man in a blue shirt underneath the kitchen sink. What's that for? It's to show that uh, with standardization, it's easier for that husband to fix his own uh, plumbing. And of course, during his uh, time as Secretary of Commerce, he began the construction of the Hoover Dam, which uh, harnesses the Colorado River near Las Vegas, Nevada. This is one of the great engineering feats of the uh, century. We had this flood down the Mississippi River, a tremendous flood, and it was the largest natural disaster our country ever faced. Mr. Hoover took charge, he went down there, and he hired 600 ships and all kinds of uh, tents and medical equipment and so forth to help the thousands and thousands of people that were homeless as a result of this flood. When that was over, uh, he and his people got together and they made plans to uh, help with flood control along the Mississippi River. And of course, there have been times when banks have overflowed since then, but because of that planning and what they did, there has never been anything like that tremendous flood of 1927. The year is 1928. Mr. Hoover is one of the most popular men in the United States, if not in the world. And the Republican Party managed to uh, get Mr. Hoover to say yes, he would run as president. And in order for him to come around and meet the people of the country, we had what we called whistle stops. And here you see Mr. and Mrs. Hoover on the back of the train talking to people in a community where that they're passing through. And after they have met these people, the train will take off and they'll go on to another town until eventually they have pretty well covered the country. We also have several pieces of memorabilia from his campaign, such as fans and light bulbs with elephants in them and uh, all kinds of things that they were using to interest people in the campaign. As you can see by the figures on the wall, he had what we call a landslide victory. When he had his inauguration, it was a very, very rainy, blustery March day but this was the first inauguration that went all over the country via radio. It was kind of a drab, uh, very formal place, and uh, 
Lou Henry had an opportunity to make some changes. Now, every president has an opportunity to design his own China to use for state affairs, but the Hoovers chose to use the China that had been made for the uh, Woodrow Wilsons during World War I. Over here is a medicine ball. Actually, we call it a Hoover ball because it was used by President Hoover to uh, kind of keep in shape. Uh, he was a little overweight when he went into the White House, and his doctors devised this game in which uh, the president and his cabinet members were involved in playing the game almost every morning on the White House lawn. Mrs. Hoover always made the White House a warm and friendly and comfortable place for her family and for her guests. She also brought a lot of culture into the White House because she entertained, or had for entertainment, some of the famous musicians of the time, uh, Paderewski, Aaron Horowitz, Yasha Heifetz, uh, Rosa Ponson. Wall Street in New York City, uh, this is where the business of the country, in fact, of the world, was taking place and still takes place. In October of 1929, Wall Street crashed. The stock market lost its value and thousands and thousands of investors, affecting millions and millions of Americans, lost millions and millions of dollars. Our country went into what we call the Great Depression. Even before Mr. Hoover became president, he was concerned that the economy was heating up too fast. He had warned President Coolidge, who was the president before him, that measures ought to be taken to sort of slow down the economy. Mr. Coolidge was not concerned, and things went on. Hoover tried to do a lot of things to get us out of the Depression, uh, but they didn't work. Uh, Hoover was a complex person, and it, he believed in the uh, strength of the individual, and that the individual could uh, pull himself up by his own bootstraps, so he relied on that a lot. But he also believed that the government had a certain uh, role in uh, helping people through tough times, such as a Depression. He set up a farm relief program to help uh, farmers that were having trouble with the, uh, the famine and the, and the droughts and things of that nature. Uh, Hoover received a lot of bad press uh, because of the bonus army. The World War I veterans were promised a bonus uh, in 1945. In 1931, they asked to have their bonus immediately. Hoover did not uh, approve that. Uh, Congress didn't approve of it. There was a march on Washington of 60,000 veterans. Riots uh, started. Uh, Mr. Hoover told Douglas MacArthur to uh, get the rioters back to their camp. Unfortunately, those orders were not obeyed, and there was violence and injuries, and uh, Mr. Hoover was blamed uh, in the newspaper. Herbert Hoover is on the knees, it seems, and there's two young ladies, and on their knees you see little impressions. And what do those impressions look like? They look like the face of Mr. Hoover. Herbert Hoover is on the knees, it seems, and truly, he was on his knees uh, during the Depression. Every president has to have a place to get away from it all. So uh, after a while, they did find this beautiful site along the Rapidan River. They bought it with their own money, $120,000, and then Lou proceeded to uh, design some buildings them to live in. So she designed several cabins, a presidential cabin, and then of course all of those that had to house the uh, Secret Service people and that sort of thing for their protection, and guest cabins as well. Who had always been quite a photographer, and she started using a movie camera. You can walk up on the porch of the cabin and look in the window and see some of Lou's home movies. After the Hoovers left the White House, of course they no longer had a need for Camp Rapid. So they gave it to the federal government. I think that Mrs. Hoover was an unusual woman for her time. Her interests were so varied, not just the outdoor life that she enjoyed but the, and the geology, but it seems that she found something to interest her in almost every phase of life. Um, her photography, her collections. Uh, here was a Quaker lady, and one of her major collections was that of weapons, which is certainly an unusual hobby for a woman to have. She was a Girl Scout before the Girl Scouts started because uh, she and her father spent a lot of time horseback riding and hiking and fishing. She is the person who uh, 
uh, we believe, was responsible for those Girl Scout cookies. She suggested that as a way of earning money. The campaign of 1932 was not a happy time for Mr. Hoover. Uh, he knew he was up against tremendous odds, but he plugged along as tirelessly to do what he could to win the election, which, of course, uh, was not to be. Now, private life for Mr. and Mrs. Hoover wasn't really miserable because they had a time to be together with their family. Mr. Hoover was busy. He wrote 23 books, and here's several of the books that he wrote. Hoover donated the money to create the uh, Hoover Institution on War and Peace on the campus of Stanford University in California. In 1936, another big thing came up for Mr. Hoover, and it's called the Boys Club of America. Now it's called, and rightly called, the Boys and Girls Club of America. The Boys Club is an attempt to provide uh, experiences for kids that live in cities so that they, can, they have some of the benefits that Hoover knew as a youngster. These are gifts that boys of the Boys Club of America made and gave to Mr. Hoover in appreciation for his efforts. And I'm sure Mr. Hoover felt these were the most important gifts that he ever received. Although in this case, we have some of the extremely, uh, shall we say, elaborate gifts that he received. Gifts from heads of state. It's a beautiful bowl from the King of Siam and some lovely brocade. So there are some lovely gifts that the, that the Hoovers received and we can show you. Toward the end of World War II, Harry Truman became president. And his feelings toward Hoover were so great that he immediately thought to bring Mr. Hoover back into public life. What he did was ask Herbert Hoover if he would continue his work as a great humanitarian and uh, pretty much do the same things that he did at the end of World War I in helping to identify those areas of the world that most needed help and uh, actually help to feed them. Well, one other th thing that Mr. Uh, Truman asked Mr. Hoover to do was to uh, try to do some efforts to reorganize the government to make it more efficiency, to cut costs and things of that nature. So Hoover did that, it was called the Hoover Commission. And roughly 75% of his recommendations uh, were approved. From 1940 to 1964, Mr. Hoover lived most of the time on the 31st floor of Waldorf Tower Hotel in New York City, Suite 31A. He had four big rooms, and those four big rooms are still there in the Waldorf Towers. Uh, he kept busy with his speeches, his books, and answering letters. This room is furnished very, very much as it might have been furnished back in the time that he was living in the Waldorf. The desk was one that he used, and the furniture has come from the Waldorf Towers. Actually, it was found uh, stored in the basement, so it wasn't furniture used by him, but it was of the period. Uh, the portrait, of course, of Lou Henry belonged to uh, Mr. Hoover. And in the corner cabinets, there are uh, several pieces of the blue and white porcelains that uh, were part of the Hoover collection. Over in the corner is a painting of Abraham Lincoln. Now, we all have favorite people, we all have favorite presidents. That was Mr. Hoover's. And he collected a lot of memorabilia of Abraham Lincoln. One of the reasons uh, Mr. Hoover came to New York City in 1940, he said, this is where the action is. And he wanted to be where the, you know, the media center was and, and uh, close to Washington, D.C. And sometimes he got tired of hotel food. So then he'd get on his hat and coat, paddle on down, and walk the streets of New York and uh, buy a meal or something like that. Here we have Herbert Hoover as a fisherman. Now, as we said earlier, Mr. Hoover learned how to fish right here in West Branch when he caught sunfish and catfish in this little creek out here that they used to dam up. And uh, his attire is a little unusual. A nice white shirt, a tie, a suit coat. In fact, I think it's an entire suit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You see what he did? He just ran into that cabin and pulled on his waders and jumped into the stream. He's just anxious to get fishing. Tis the chance to wash one's soul with pure air, with the rush of the brook, or with the shimmer of the sun on the blue water. It brings meekness and inspiration from the decency of nature charity toward cattle makers, patience toward fish, 
a mockery of prophets and egos, a quieting of heat, a rejoicing that you do not have to decide a darn thing until next week. And it is discipline in the equality of men, for all men are equal before fish. Now here's a fellow that started out as a mining engineer in Australia, they called him Chief. They called him Hail Columbia. They called him Secretary of Commerce. They called him President of the United States. But it was never, never, never Secretary of Commerce, President of the United States, author of 23 books, and all that other stuff. The great humanitarian. 50 years, 1914 to 1964. It's been our pleasure to walk through the museum exhibit with you and we hope. We hope that you'll be able to come and visit us in person because we have a lot of wonderful things to show you and tell you about at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Museum and Library in West Branch, Iowa.